Uh, currently, I'm the interim associate vice provost for community equity and diversity here at UNE and also men's basketball coach. And I'm also the UNE's athletics diversity and inclusion designee for the NCAA. I'm going to be the host for today's event, Cracking the Zip Code, Decoding Environmental Injustice, in which three UNE experts will explore how the places we live have a major impact on our well-being. Our surrounding environments mediate our health and actions in countless ways, including the air, water, and housing quality we're exposed to, and our ease of access to safe outdoor space, nutritious food, healthcare, education, and economic opportunity. Today's event is brought to you through a partnership between the Planetary Health Council and Center for Excellence in Collaborative Education. Since 2017, UNE has been an in institutional member of the International Planetary Health Alliance, a Harvard-led consortium of more than 250 universities, non-governmental organizations, and other institutions spanning more than 50 countries. At UNE, our Planetary Health Council is working to strengthen bridges between our robust environmental sciences and health professions programs, and to provide planetary health content through academics, research, and events just like this one. This event will address interprofessional competencies of values and ethics in communication, and can be applied towards UNE students' interprofessionals honors distinction badge. Just for an overview of the event, today's program will begin first with introductions from today's speakers. Then the panelists will give their presentations on this important topic. We are then allocating ample time for audience participation and discussion with all of you, as well as our closing remarks. I will now invite our student discussion moderator, Kara Frischkorn, to introduce herself. Thanks for the introduction, Ed. Uh, nice to meet everybody. My name is Kiara and I am a Marine Affairs major minoring in climate change and political science. If you have any questions or comments during the panelist discussion today, please put them in the chat and include your name, major, or program. And I will now pass it off to our first panelist to introduce herself, um, Elizabeth Mann. Hi, thanks, Kiara. So hi, everyone. I'm so glad you've all joined us today. My name is Liz Mann. I'm a clinical educator at UNE Center for Excellence in Public Health. Um, my expertise and training is in advanced public health nursing, and so I'm really excited to be a part of this panel to share a public health perspective of environmental justice with you. I will now hand it off to our second panelist to introduce herself, Bridget Har. Hi everyone, thanks Liz for the introduction. Um, my name is Bridget Haar and I'm an assistant professor of sociology in the College of Arts and Sciences. My work centers the construction of race and science in medicine, but I do teach classes about environmental sociology and environmental inequality. I'll now pass it off to Professor Rick Peterson, our third panelist. Hi, good afternoon everyone. My name is uh, Professor Rick Peterson in the, uh, I'm professor of environmental studies in the School of Marine and Environmental Programs. It's a real pleasure to be here today. Thanks to all who have organized this. Thank you for coming. Just want to say that I, I taught a course on environmental racism and the environmental justice movement in 2006 at UNE, and no one signed up for it. And I tried to teach the course again this past semester, and it filled within a matter of, of hours. And I think that's, I took that as a really hopeful sign in terms of how uh, students' interests have changed over the years. Thank you. I'll turn it back to Ed. Thanks, Rick. And thank you to everyone. We really have an amazing group of experts gathered here today. Now I'm going to turn it back to Elizabeth Mann, our first panelist, to share her expertise in public health and the influence of socioecological determinants of health. All right. Thank you so much, so much, Ed. So I would like to start today just uh, simply by sharing a definition of environmental justice that aligns sort of most authentically with my public health minded brain. Um, I think this should also help to frame my portion of the conversation going forward and hopefully evoke a more expansive view of the environment. So environmental justice is the right to a safe and healthy environment. It includes the economic, social, and political factors in a community which together with the natural and built environments create opportunities for health. But we know not everyone in America has the same opportunities. Um, we know there are drivers of inequitable conditions within and across place that can dramatically reduce opportunities for better health and well-being. 
And so within the concept of environmental justice, that reality is not ignored. And actually, um, it highlights the specific vulnerable communities for whom that right is threatened and how. Next slide, please. So my first duty is to sort of break down the relationship of zip code in health and why it's considered more consequential than our blood pressure, our cholesterol, and even our genetics. So I wanted to share this. It is the county health rankings model of community health that outlines the many factors that influence how long and how well we live. It shows that policies and programs play important roles in influencing health factors that in turn shape a community's health outcomes. I want to focus in on the health factors that branch out into that middle darker blue column and their estimated influence on health outcomes as part of the whole. So one thing in particular that kind of blew my mind when I first learned about it as a nursing student is that clinical care accounts for just 20% of health outcomes, while social and economic factors like education and family and social supports have twice the impact. So what I hope this shows sort of very briefly, very simply, is that as I'm talking about zip code being um, the biggest predictor of health, what I'm really talking about are the social and structural determinants of health uh, within a defined community. Those non-medical factors, many are listed there in that far right column like education, income, social support, and the policies and programs that shape them that have tremendous impacts on individual and population health, health disparities, and ultimately health equity. Next slide, please. Next, I would like to introduce a popular public health framework. It's the social ecological model that can also help us to sort of better understand the significance of zip code. This model asserts that people live their lives within multiple spheres of influence from the individual micro level out to the societal macro level, all of which impact their behaviors and health. Um, when it comes to an individual's health, sadly, there can be some blame placed on the individual in poor health. Well, you know, maybe their diabetes wouldn't be so out of control if they just ate better or exercised or took their medication as they were supposed to. And surely those are important behaviors for managing diabetes, but one's ability to engage in those behaviors is rarely entirely within their control. So this model helps to sort of broaden the focus beyond the individual to see the influence of interpersonal interactions, organizational practices, community conditions and public policy that impact health more than simply individual behaviors and choices. Next slide, please. So what I'd like to do now is present an example and perhaps and it's, it's an extreme example, but it's also very real of the power of public policy, that sort of outermost sphere of influence to shape the environment, to shape determinants of health and to effectively perpetuate health inequities for generations, especially among minority populations, and that's the practice of redlining. Um, so back in the 1930s, the private and federal housing sectors together began the process of grading neighborhoods in over 200 cities across the country, color coding them like so on maps, and to no one's surprise, undesirable neighborhoods that were marked red or redlined were predominantly made up of African Americans especially but also religious minorities, immigrants, and some low-income white residents. And these hazardous neighborhoods were flagged as credit risks by local lenders. So, you know, what did that mean? Essentially, it was difficult, even impossible, to secure a home loan in those areas. And for decades, almost 100% of government-backed mortgage loans went to white Americans. This contributed to residential segregation, concentrated disadvantage, and um, maldistribution of community resources. Next slide, please. So what's really interesting about this policy is that those color-coded maps provide historical documentation of the practice of redlining, which have since been used to examine its long-term effects on those redlined areas and populations. And so I thought we could take a look at the city closest to us that was redlined, and that's Manchester, New Hampshire, just about 100 miles away. So on the left is the the map circa 1937 on the right is a snapshot of the CDC's social vulnerability index scores for census tracts in Manchester today. Um, social vulnerability in this context refers to the potential negative effects on communities caused by external stresses on health. And a particular area score takes into account a number of social and economic factors. So the higher the score, which can range from zero to one, the more vulnerable that community is. 
Uh, I just wanted to mention that these images and the, the related data we're going to sort of talk about were taken from a really fascinating resource maintained by the University of Richmond, and that link should be shared with you in the chat box. So we have census tracts A1 and D3 circled in green and red respectively, and they're separated by about one mile. In 1937, A1 was coded green. Look at that, it's still green today, meaning it has a very low social vulnerability score. Now, back in the day, D3 covered an area that was mostly red, and today it has one of the highest social vulnerability scores in the city. So we can assume it's you know, not thriving in many respects. Now, we could compare many metrics between these two neighborhoods, and you'll actually see some on the next slide, but I want to focus on life expectancy right now. So in green A1, life expectancy is 81.5 years, and in red pink D3, it's 67.3 years. That's a difference of over 14 years in communities that are just one mile apart. Next slide, please. So even though redlining was banned in the late 60s, its lingering effects can still be seen today more than 50 years later. So as these redlined areas declined because of diminished economic opportunities, increased economic instability, and inadequate deteriorating infrastructure, among other things, their residents were exposed to fewer health-promoting resources and greater health-damaging threats, thus creating resource and opportunity-starved environments conducive to so many poor health outcomes. Next slide, please. So I'm going to bear with me, try to get through this uh, quickly because my time is fast running out, but I do want to come back to the social ecological model and quickly review some of the factors within each of its levels so that you can start to think about how together they might create the environments and influence the behaviors that contribute to the kind of disparities in life expectancy and other health outcomes that we see not just in Manchester, but in zip codes across the country. So that outermost sphere of influence is public policy at federal, state, and local levels that can impact scores of people, as we've seen with housing policies like redlining, though I guess luckily not all of them are as explicitly discriminatory. Other influences include the accessibility and adequacy of social welfare programs and minimum wage policies that have the potential to lift people out of or keep them in poverty. Next is the community level, community conditions, resources, and their distribution, and their influences on behaviors and health. Examples include the presence of those health promoting resources like the ones listed there, exposure to health hazards within the physical environment, and then community stressors such as crime and discrimination. Next slide, please. So moving a little bit further inward, we come to the organizational level where community institutions can shape behaviors as they often sort of enforce behavior determining regulations. Some examples include employers, um, schools is, is a great example. We have compulsory education laws for children, but are their schools adequately funded and staffed? Are they safe? Can meaningful learning take place there? Um, also healthcare systems, and not just are they present in a community, but are they accessible? Are they adequately staffed? Are they providing quality care to the community? What policies or procedures do they enforce? And what community programs do they invest in that might encourage or discourage certain behaviors? And here, I just want to briefly note the importance of acknowledging if um, or how systemic or structural racism can affect organizational operations and relationships with the community at large. Um, obviously, one's relationships within social networks can impact behaviors too. So are people in healthy, inclusive relationships that provide them with support to make healthy decisions? What are the effects of implicit biases they may be subject to on their behavior and health? We've also touched upon um, how residential segregation can be harmful, but there's also evidence that it may have a lesser yet protective effect by building a collective identity and social capital, which can also promote health and well being. Next slide. And finally, we get to the individual, where the characteristics of the person, like those listed here, many of which are the products of all of those other levels, influence their behavior and health. Things like knowledge about healthy behaviors, attitudes and beliefs. And I think this is really important. You know, some marginalized folks may have developed something of a fatalistic outlook. You know, if so many of their family and friends have died prematurely from one cause or another, they might believe that that's just their fate and that there's really nothing they can do to change it. 
Additionally, especially African Americans may have a justified mistrust of the healthcare system, which could certainly influence their healthcare seeking behaviors. And then, of course, there's income, you know, a significant determinant of health affecting overall living conditions and the behaviors listed there. So that is it for me. And I really do hope that this was a helpful, if brief, introduction to how zip code, sort of meaning all of the environments surrounding and influencing a person, can be so consequential to their quality of life and longevity. So with that, I thank you. Elizabeth, thank you so much. That, that was amazing. And I, and I love how you really connected that, um, that social, uh, that environmental injustice is really about racial and social injustice as well. Um, so that was tremendous. Professor Bridget Haar, will you will now examine these issues from a sociological perspective, including the politicization of science. Thanks, Ed, and hello again, everyone. My focus today will be on a relatively recent and rather well-known case of environmental racism, the Flint water crisis. Flint is helpful in demonstrating why I think it is so challenging for us to decode environmental injustice and, and why it is often challenging to both recognize and rectify socially produced health vulnerabilities. These challenges are seen time and time again in struggles for environmental justice, as people who experience the negative health effects of environmental racism expend considerable time and energy simply having their claims of ill health taken seriously. Part of what compounds the, the circumstances of aggrieved persons and communities is that their embodied and experiential knowledge is considered illegitimate. Historically, it has not been enough for communities to come together and say, when the incinerator is running, I can't breathe. Rather, their claims are not validated until experts with formal training and credentials acknowledge and legitimate their truths. These circumstances are troubling, as often formal knowledge, like the knowledge that comes from scientific research, is used to uphold, not contest, power and inequality. Needing to appeal to expertise can disempower communities, making it more difficult or more time consuming to access, access resources and mitigate harm. Further, though scientific and medical knowledge is regularly revised and transformed, outdated ideas about race persist in both science and society. And as I'll suggest today, both popular and scientific understandings of race and difference influence whether and how we problematize instances of environmental injustice. This is because the effects of certain forms of environmental exposure, exposure resonate with long ago, yet long standing ideas about race and difference. Next slide, please. So I wanna begin by first explaining a couple of concepts that I'll be drawing on today. The first is racial science, which is also commonly known as scientific racism and refers to scientific and medical efforts that either seek to establish or otherwise presume that race has a biological basis. There are countless examples of racial and racist science. Some of these are from long ago, like the pseudoscientific field of phrenology depicted here on the bottom left, which sought to explain differences in character and cognition by analyzing skull size and shape. But there are other more contemporary examples, such as race-normed medical technologies like the spirometer, which to this day uses different metrics for expected lung capacity among people of different races. There are also race-specific pharmaceuticals, such as Vital, which combines two generic medications used to treat heart failure in everyone into a single medication used to treat heart failure in Black people. Each of these forms of racial science are examples of the next concept, racial essentialism, which refers to the belief that racial groups are fundamentally distinct from one another. These supposed inherent racial differences are often explained through appeals to biology, seeking to locate the site and source of racial difference in the body, brain, or blood. Essentialist ideas about race serve a political purpose in that they naturalize racial inequality by explaining race and not racism as the cause of racial difference and disparities. The study of the social determinants of health, including today's attention to how and why zip code is a strong predictor of health outcomes, are often intended to work against essentialist understandings of race and difference, working against the idea that race and not place is the cause of health inequalities. Next slide. In my work, I study different ideas about race and health and what they do in the world. I study how some ideas about race are used to help reduce racial inequality, whereas other ideas about race are used to normalize or deepen racial inequality. I also consider how outmoded knowledge of race and difference, for example, ideas about racial essentialism that have long been dispelled, recirculate and reemerge in different contexts. 
Given our focus on environmental injustice, I want to provide some background as to how appeals to the environment have been used to justify and naturalize racial hierarchies. Attention to the relationship between race and the environment emerged in long ago philosophical debates about the origins of racial difference, as both scientists and humanists considered the influence of geography and climate. And today, I'll suggest that this deterministic relationship between race and the environment might explain our non-response to various forms of environmental injustice. For example, in the context of Flint, the effects of lead exposure resonate with and, refa and refashion antiquated science no scientific knowledge of race and disease. Next slide. So I'll start with a little bit of background on Flint. Uh, in late April 2014, Flint's water supply switched from Lake Huron to the Flint River, discontinuing Flint's use of Detroit's water system. The switch was framed as temporary and motivated by cost savings, lasting only until a new pipeline could be constructed, directly connecting Flint to Lake Huron. Within a month of the switch, residents began to raise concern over the water quality, bringing attention to its discoloration, malodor, accompanying foul smell, or foul taste, excuse me, um, and later negative health effects. In the case of Flint, it's clear that residents' exposure to lead, bacteria, and other contaminants in the drinking water was not natural or even circumstantial. Instead, it was caused, created, and perpetuated by people with power and the policies they influence and inspire. And though the incidence of lead poisoning was socially produced, the effects of lead poisoning resonate with outdated ideas about racial essentialism. So for the rest of my time, I'll consider how the resonance of racial science might explain both the initial inattention and persistent inaction surrounding the Flint water crisis. Next slide. So to begin, I'll remind everyone of some of the embodied effects of lead exposure, including irreversible intellectual, emotional, and behavioral changes, ranging from cognitive impairment to irritability to aggression. Now recall that the environment has long been used to explain and naturalize racial differences and disparities. So as I suggest here, in the context of environmental exposure, it becomes a mechanism to assert that though a person may not have been born, they have nonetheless become essentially different. Outcomes associated with lead exposure refashion outdated scientific knowledge of race and persistent racial stereotypes. The cognitive effects are said to lower IQ, a metric intended to measure innate intelligence, and coincide with eugenicist notions of intellectual inferiority. Similarly, the behavioral effects are, are said to lead to truancy and the potential for increased criminality, coinciding with common racialized conceptions of violence and crime. These resonances with racial science were, were both noticed and problematized and at times reasserted by the people of Flint. In my remaining time, I'll offer just a few examples of the community's engagement with racial essentialism. Next slide. My first example comes from Councilwoman Monica Galloway, who in her discussion and critique of the state's inaction, despite local residents' complaints said, quote, this is just another thing that says to me, we are like guinea pigs. It's like a research project that we would normally do on rats. Here she's recalling histories of racist medical experimentation where the dehumanization of black people, she signals this by equating Flint's predominantly black population to guinea pigs and rats, justified atrocious forms of medical exploitation. Historical examples include J. Marion Sims, the purported father of modern gynecology, whose surgical experimentations on enslaved Black women were justified in part by their presumed higher pain tolerance. This is a racist and essentialist idea that persists today with grave consequences for the medical mistreatment of Black people. A contemporary example would be reports last year of coerced sterilizations in ICE detention centers, but there are many, many others, and there are a series of um, book recommendations that, that are in the chat so that folks can learn more. Uh, next slide. Next, I'll turn to an example that risks reinforcing racial essentialism instead of problematizing it like Councilwoman Galloway did. This is evidenced in the professed concern by Flint journalist Kevin Blackstone that the health effects of contaminated drinking water might compromise the athletic prowess and celebrated athletic tradition in Flint. Implied here is an essentialist argument about racialized physical superiority, as historically, essentialist ideas about physical strength and stamina serve to justify the labor exploitation of Black people. Blackstone says, quote, Flint makes automobiles and athletes. Until now, there was never a, th a threat to Flint's athletic talent running out. This is a risky argument. It reinforces essentialist ideas about race used to justify inequality and naturalize difference. It speaks to the idea that Black athleticism might be explained through processes of selection or efforts to ensure, quote, better breeding on the part of slave owners who would have economically benefited from creating the strongest enslaved population possible. 
And just to be clear, be clear, I'm intentionally signaling eugenicist thought there. Concerning to me is the ways that this has entered the popular, popular imaginary with Black athletes like track star Michael Johnson explaining their athletic prowess through this logic. Johnson starred in a BBC documentary called Michael Johnson, Survival of the Fastest, which I offer not in support of the argument. There will be a link in the chat <laughs> to be clear. I'm not supportive of the argument, but it's a way to better understand the persistence of essentialist claims about Black athleticism and physical superiority. Next slide. Finally, I offer this most overt and egregious reference to scientific racism in which a state public health nurse said to Leanne Walters, one of the major community activists and citizen scientists in Flint, quote, it's just a few IQ points. It's not the end of the world. For the sake of time, I'll simply note that this statement evokes the long history of scientific efforts to establish and explain the intellectual capacity of different racial groups to lend legitimacy to the popular idea of innate intellectual inferiority and superiority. Um, in terms of the resources in, th in the chat, I do just want to flag Harriet Washington's recent book called A Terrible Thing to Waste, Environmental Racism and Its Assault on the American Mind. In this book, Washington explicitly critiques racist concepts like IQ and explains how communities of color are disproportionately exposed to social determinants of health that impact intelligence. This work is at once critically important and potentially risky, given the history of environmental determinism and how appeals to the environment have been used to explain and naturalize racial difference. Next slide. All right, so with that, I'll just leave you with some final considerations. We should continue to prioritize inquiry that centers the social and structural causes of both illness and inequality, but we should be wary of how the environment is evoked to redeploy essentialist ideas of race and difference. If there's one thing to take away, it's to remember that the political use of science, medicine, and other appeals to expertise come with risks. Here today, I've talked about of essentialism. And thus, we should collectively endeavor to extend our understanding of expertise. We should bring new forms of knowledge from unexpected sources into the realm of legitimate and authoritative knowledge generally, and with regard to the causes and consequences and proposed solutions to environmental injustice. Thank you. Professor Har, uh, I think I speak for everyone in saying thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, that was that was tremendous, and thanks for sharing your expertise. Uh, Professor Richard Peterson will now tie in the evolving work of the environmental justice justice movement, including a few current issues facing Maine. Thank you, just um, Bridget. That was um, really a very powerful presentation. It gave me lots to think about um, in your analysis there of this case of Flint. I'm going to step back a bit and talk a little bit more broadly about the response to environmental justice that's shown through the environmental justice movement. Environmental injustice, of course, is as old as human civilization. There's always been some group that has always gotten the raw end of the deal in regard to access to nature's resources or to nature's beauty or later in regard to nature's despoliation on the part of human enterprise. But even so, there has always also been resistance. People standing up and saying, this isn't right. And then fighting to make things right, putting environmental justice into action. But as a social and environmental movement, environmental justice really didn't get off the ground until the 1980s. And one of the incidents that is often marked as the beginning of the movement was in 1982 in Warren County, North Carolina. Warren County had the highest percentage of African-American residents in the entire state, 64%. And it was nevertheless the county that was chosen uh, by the EPA as the site for a new toxic waste landfill. The landfill was to hold truckloads upon truckloads of toxic soil that had been contaminated with PCBs due to nighttime dumping of the soil along 200 miles of North Carolina highways by the Ward Transformer Company of Raleigh, North Carolina. The fact that Warren County was chosen generated a lot of action on the part of local residents. 500 people were arrested during the direct action protests that ensued. And it's this incident of Warren County that prompted a number of studies Perhaps most, the earliest was in 1983, the Government Accounting Office found that 75% of toxic waste landfills in eight Southern states were in predominantly African-American communities, even though African-Americans were only 20% of the region's population. 
Further studies since then, such as the United Church of Christ study in 1987, toxic waste and race in the United States have confirmed this correlation between Lulu's uh, locally unwanted land uses and communities of color over and over again. The burgeoning activism that was ignited by Warren County eventually caught the attention of the Clinton administration. And in 1994, they issued executive order 12898 that directs all federal agencies to identify and address adverse environmental and health effects of their actions, which disproportionately burden minority and low income communities. Like all executive actions, executive orders, they only carry so much weight to the, to the degree that they're actually put into practice. And it's a record of 12898's record since 94 has been very mixed indeed. But I want to go on to stress how, if you go to the next slide, I want to stress how from these early beginnings, the environmental justice movement of today has grown tremendously far beyond addressing some of these initial pressing concerns that affected communities of color, such as toxic dumping and inequalities in bearing the burden of environmental hazards. Today, the movement is indeed truly a global movement with actions taking place all over around the world, addressing issues within particular countries, but also between countries, most prominently between the countries of the global North and those of the global South. And this has become most pronounced through what is known today as climate justice, giving rise to what is being called the climate justice movement, whose actions stem from the irony that those least responsible for climate change are disproportionately bearing the costs. Other areas of environmental justice activism and scholarship have addressed today such things as protected areas and indigenous peoples that live in those areas, something giving rise to what is called conservation justice. The issue of indigenous rights and sovereignty and land reclamation is another area. And in that regard, if you go to the next slide, Maine, our own state, is one of the nation's hotspots. Wabanaki sovereignty and inability to govern their natural resources and to address the environmental health and economic disparity issues affecting their communities are critical issues for all Mainers. The 1980 Indian Claims Settlement Act created unique conditions for Maine tribes that significantly limited their sovereignty compared to that of all the other federally recognized tribes in the United States. This ongoing erosion of Native people's rights in Maine has centered on the rights to and the authority to manage the Penobscot River, with the Penobscot Nation continuing to battle the state of Maine in the courts over the extent to which Penobscot land includes not only the river's islands, but also some 60 miles of the river itself, the river that is part and parcel of their livelihood and their identity as a sovereign nation. At a recent rally for the Penobscot River and Wabanaki sovereignty, Penobscot lawyer Cheryl, Cherry Mitchell lamented how, and I quote, Mainers are letting this happen. Michael Corey Hinton, a Passamaquoddy lawyer, describes things this way. The history of indigenous settler relations in Maine and New England has been one of ethnic erasure. So what are some solutions? Maine's indigenous leaders are calling on all majority Mainers to be ready to support LD 1626, an act implementing the recommendations of the Task Force on Changes to the Maine Indian Claims Settlement Act. That will be coming up in the Maine legislature for debate this coming legislative session. Review of this 1980 law has served as the most recent focal point for seeking justice against the, state, the state's abrogation on its responsibilities towards Wabanaki peoples. There are many resources for learning more about these issues that are taking place here in Maine. I include several here that are also going to be in the chat. Um, the Sunlight Media Collective is an organization of indigenous and non-indigenous media makers and activists that are documenting and presenting stories that are affecting Wabanaki people, especially in regard to environmental injustices. The Wabanaki Alliance was formed in June of 2020 by leaders of Maine's tribes to educate Mainers about the need for Maine's tribes to secure their sovereignty. 
And Wabanaki Reach is an organization dedicated to self-determination of Wabanaki peoples through education, truth-telling, and restorative justice. And I also want to plug the upcoming Donna Loring lecture right here at UNE, Racial Justice in Maiden State Policy. That will be taking place on October 6th. So there's lots of opportunities to get involved and to learn more about these issues affecting our own state and the native peoples that have inhabited it for many years before us. With regard, uh, next slide, please. So with regard to environmental justice more broadly, um, and I'm gonna just talk a bit about what's happening at the federal level. I, we are currently seeing a greater commitment to strengthening EJ efforts within government agencies building on <clears throat> strengthening the revision, the um, strengths, that, the revisions to, for instance, Executive Order 12898, uh, the, the strengthening that happened with the Obama administration. President Biden recently issued his own Executive Order 13990 that, again, is mandating all federal agencies to prioritize environmental justice. There are two bills that are currently in committee in the House of Representatives. H.R. 2021, the Environmental Justice for All Act, and H.R. 2434, Environmental Justice Act of 2021. So <clears throat> finally, Michael Regan, the new administrator of the EPA, one of his earliest moves was to direct all EPA offices to integrate environmental justice into their plans and actions and to embed equity into their programs and services. Again, the proof will be in the pudding, the fact that there is much more action taking place within the last two years at the federal level on environmental justice is encouraging. The EPA, next slide please. I also want to highlight a couple of resources that the EPA has created and continues to improve. <clears throat> These are resources that allow communities that are afflicted by environmental justice to have access, easier access to key data. One of those is called EJ Screen. It's a GIS mapping tool, which uses GIS technologies to overlay different environmental and demographic indicators to create what they call EJ indexes. These are identifying areas of the country and area in communities, which based on this combination of environmental indicators and demographic indicators, such as percentage minority population, income, so on and so forth, to, to show areas in a visual manner through maps that are highly vulnerable to incidents of environmental injustice. Next slide, please. The EPA's longstanding toxic release inventory has also been improved recently, such that when you're looking for industries that have reported to the EPA release of toxic substances. Linked to that, to those slides, as you can see here on the slide on the right, there's a direct link also to the EJ report of those surrounding areas. That didn't used to be there before. So that you can easily now get <clears throat> data on both demographics and on environmental indicators in the communities that are right around where these industries are located, industries that have reported their toxic releases to the EPA. Next slide. There is so much going on in regard to the social movement side of things that I won't have time to try to list some of those. I do want to though refer you to a couple of resources that I think are really very helpful. One is EJNet. That will link you to many other uh, in, documents, resources, uh, important parts of the history of the environmental justice movement, as well as what is currently happening. The other site, next slide, is the website of Dr. Robert Bullard, professor environmental sociologist at Texas Southern University, often referred to as the father of environmental justice. And his site also is a very, very rich resource for learning more about what's taking place in regard to the environmental justice movement. Next slide. I want to end um, with this quote from Hop Hopkins, who is the Director of Strategic Partnerships for the Sierra Club. I like, uh, be, I, I'm including this because of the way that it represents the interlinkages between environmental injustice, climate change, 
and institutionalized racism. I also want to include it because of how he's pointing to the fact that solutions to any of these issues are truly going to take a collaborative endeavor. So let's, let me work through this here. Hopkins says you can't have climate change without sacrifice zones, and you can't have sacrifice zones without disposable people, and you can't have disposable people without racism. You can choose, we as a society can choose to live a different way. Indeed, we must. If our society valued all people's lives equally, there wouldn't be any sacrifice zones to put the pollution in. If we valued everyone's lives equally, if we placed the public health and well-being of the many above the profits of the few, there wouldn't be a climate crisis. There would be nowhere to put a coal plant because no one would accept the risks of living near such a monster if they had the power to choose. If climate change and environmental injustice are the result of a society that values some lives and not others, then none of us are safe from pollution until all of us are safe from pollution. Dirty air doesn't stop at the county line and carbon pollution doesn't respect national borders. As long as we keep letting the polluters sacrifice black and brown communities, we can't protect our shared global climate. Thank you. Look forward to further discussion. Many thanks to you, Professor Peterson, and to all of our panelists today for sharing their wide breadth of knowledge and expertise on these urgent issues. Now we're going to encourage questions and comments from all of you in the audience. For viewers from Zoom or Facebook Live, please type your questions and stories or reactions using the chat function. Those in the rooms on campus can also participate on chat on their own devices. We want to hear your perspective on these issues, on these urgent issues. And as current and future leaders in the health professions and environmental sciences, and as engaged citizens of our community and the world, our student discussion moderator, Kara Fishcorn, will now facilitate this conversation. All right, so starting off with our first question, we have, um, have you seen any of these issues affect the UNE community? And more specifically, what about Maine in total? Um, and this question would be for any of the panelists. I suppose I can I can jump in here um, and bring up I guess something that you know probably a lot of people tuning in today are aware of but one glaring and pretty recent example of health inequity affecting marginalized or vulnerable populations in Maine we all saw at the beginning of the COVID nineteen pandemic you know that early data showed that Maine's BIPOC and immigrant populations were being adversely and disproportionately affected by COVID-19 infection. Um, to the extent that Maine had the very dubious distinction of the nation's largest racial disparity. Um, back in June 2020, I think the last time I checked my data, Black people in Maine accounted for about a quarter of the COVID cases, yet only 1.4% of the state's total population. And the, the uh, fact of the matter is that that didn't happen by accident. You know, that's a painful reminder, a wake up call, a red flag, whatever you want to call it, that the environmental contexts in which BIPOC Mainers live, all of those layers of influence have placed them at increased risk of morbidity and mortality from COVID-19 and other infectious diseases. So that's one that I can sort of call to mind right now. And I, I'll jump in with just one more, again, a historical example. And I'm, I apologize, if anyone, anyone help me out with um, uh, pronunciation here, but uh, Mal Malaga Island, are folks familiar? Malaga Island? I'm not sure how I'm, how I'm supposed to say that. Um, but it was a site of a Black population in Maine um, that was dispossessed of their land and relocated to sort of a state institution and asylum, which uh, on the site of which is now Pineland Farms. Um, so histories of medical racism that intersect with environmental injustice in terms of land sovereignty and access to land rights um, is present here. I can, I'll share a link in the chat for more information. 
Yeah, I just want to add that these is the issues that are I highlighted in regard to Native, Maine's Native peoples are also, I think, a very important aspect of, of, of examples of environmental injustice here that apply not just to govern, I focused on governing of resources um, and rights to those resources, but they also imply, of course, to the Wabanaki's ability to be able to um, make decisions about how, how to manage the disparities in, in health care um, and, and health outcomes from their populations um, compared to the majority main population. Um, these issues, of course, travel across both health and uh, natural resource uh, parameters. Thank you. And for the next question, I have from Shelly CK, and she's asking, how can individuals take action to affect uh, environmental injustice? I guess I could jump in again too, and um, I I suppose you know my my one recommendation for just you know us as general citizens of the state and in this country of the world um, is to be active in um, the policy making process. I think the one thing that we've seen a common thread throughout all of our presentations today is how um, policy has created these conditions um, that have harmed. Um, certain populations. Um, and so uh, I think that's, you know, one, you know, somewhat easy thing that we could do is just be aware of what's going on legislatively in our, um, in our, in our state, um, and to do what we can to lend our voices, um, especially to um, uh, communities that may not uh, have a voice, um, one that's being recognized or listened to, um, in order to make sure that policies um, promote health and equity for everyone. Can I, I'll jump in, sorry. I don't know, Rick, if you're about to speak. Um, uh, I would say also that it, my own discipline both analyzes structure, but doesn't necessarily pose legislative solutions um, or prioritize legislative solutions that often um, it's, it's like thinking about the way legislative solutions are effective in localized communities through direct action. Um, but, that, but there's a lot, I mean, what the pandemic has revealed is that the importance and um, great great effectiveness of mutual aid networks. And there are a number of mutual aid networks locally um, addressing, whether it be food apartheid and insecurity, um, mutual aid for, for health and healthcare. Um, and, and I'm happy to share some of those too, um, as one way to get involved individually and land rematriation too, that there's a, a endeavors for that among the Wabanaki as well. Yeah, I just, uh, I think the first step, this is a bit of a truism, but it's, but it, it's truthful is that first step is educating your oneself, educating ourselves continuously on these issues. I think the issues, for instance, of Wabanaki sovereignty in this state are very, very, very little known by the majority of the main population. So um, being coming more educated ab about the history there, um, the current um, situations with the, the battle in the courts, that the Wabanaki have, have, have been involved in. They, they are currently think, planning, I believe, to take their case to the Supreme Court of the United States. Um, so becoming more educated um, through spending, spending time on, on understanding these issues and then following the lead of Native peoples uh, in their efforts and asking how one might be able to support those. And sometimes that's just showing up. That's just showing up at the rallies that they might be holding to, to educate Mainers about their situation, um, showing up in solidarity. Um, what danger, of course, is that we might try to lead the way. I think it's really important to um, be a student of um, rather than uh, a director of these efforts. And, and um, I think there's going to be a lot more that's happening. I think that the state is... Uh, things that broke things are breaking open <laughs> in a positive way and so there's going to be uh, opportunities for people to gain greater education and become involved and i think this law that's going to be in terms of relooking at the 1980 uh, 
law, the 1980 Indian Claim Settlement Act. This is a really going to be a key focal point for the upcoming legislative session. Hearing, going to public testimonies and, and on that bill um, is going to be really uh, one way that you can get directly involved. All right, thank you for those comments. Um, and our next question comes from Huayda. I apologize if I mispronounced that. And they're asking, isn't it time to have a core curriculum for environmental injustice? It is so clear that it touches every aspect of our lives and connects all disciplines together, something that we have been aspiring to achieve through the Planetary Health Council. I totally would agree with you, Huayda, that it is time. Um, we do have, we are unique, somewhat unique, in that we do require as part of our core curriculum a course called Introduction to Environmental Issues, ENV 104. And all students in the College of Arts and Sciences are required to take that. <clears throat> and that's been going for almost 30 years now, that requirement. More and more of our curricula in that course is paying attention to environmental injustice issues. Um, and especially now with climate change has always been a focus of that course, but also bringing in issues of climate justice. Um, so, but there's much more that needs to be done. And I would like to see some type of course required in all colleges, not just the College of Arts and Sciences. And I believe we have time for one more question, and that would be from Susan, Susan Faraday, which is who, um, who is asking, how can UNE as an academic institution better educate all our students on these issues and prepare them to engage effectively? I'd be interested to hear from Elizabeth and people from other colleges, um, and because I, I'm ignorant, I think that this might already be happening, but place-based education in terms of taking our students into, this, into the actual arenas in which we're, these health disparities are, are happening, it, meeting with the community-based organizations that are, are fighting against those, having our students have that direct experiential learning opportunity. Um, and you don't have to go far right here in Portland. Um, um, I think that that's, that, that that's one way of being able to better educate our students on this is by creating these experiential learning activities. And Elizabeth, I'd be interested if that is already happening in the College of Health Professions. It might very well be, and kudos to you all, and, and in the College of Medicine as well. Well, I mean, I could certainly, I am, I, I'm not associated with any particular college here at UNE, which is kind of wonderful in a way, because I do get sort of that cross-section of interaction with students. Um, but we do have some programming. You know, I think the fact that we have such a robust interprofessional education um, program here at UNE sort of obviously prepares students to come into their professions with um, a, a base understanding of what everyone else sort of, what their scope is. Um, and understand sort of what they can bring to the table in working to solve these really complicated problems. And so I think that's something that UNE is already doing well. But I agree with you, Rick, that 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 if the experiential um, opportunities um, where you're able to sort of take what you are learning about in, in your in your didactic um, and, and apply that to real world situations, that's something that we try to do with our AHEC Scholars Program here at UNE, um, which some of our um, some of our audience members might be aware of or might be part of um, where in their clinical rotations, we really try to get them to um, get out into the community, understand the, the needs and the priorities of that community and engage um, across sectors and across professions um, to, to sort of learn about what, it, what it's going to take to sort of work collaboratively to solve those problems. And I think that's, that's a, huge, a huge part of it for sure. I'd like to thank all of our amazing audience members you know, for these great insightful questions and comments and, and especially thank our talented discussion moderator, Kara Fishcorn, for facilitating such a lively and engaging discussion. 
Um, for the sake of time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to now invite our panelists to share their closing thoughts. Panelists, in a few words, please share your vision for collaboration. How can all of us uh, across professions and disciplines uh, work together to help promote a future of greater environmental justice? And, and please feel free to share your insights in the same order in which you presented. Okay, thanks, Ed. Um, you know, I think a lot of the things that come to mind are what we've already spoken about today. Um, certainly, you know, always being on a quest for um, um, educating yourself about the um, issues and problems in your community um, and, uh, and reaching out to uh, members of the community and, and figuring out how to take action. Um, I think what makes me sort of the most optimistic about collaboration on issues of environmental justice is the future is that there's really no debate anymore, you know, kind of going back to, to my core material, I presented today that the social and structural determinants are crucial to the health of populations and communities. And so um, I'm hopeful that now we can take the time, the energy and the resources that might have been spent on sort of debating that and putting those towards solutions. Um, and I think that that kind of consensus should hopefully make it easier for sectors to coalesce around priority community health goals and to bring their own areas of expertise and strengths to the table because we're going to need all of that, um, including, you know, the voices and the perspectives of the communities being impacted by harmful policies. Um, that's all going to be necessary to be able to solve these problems. So um, I really, I feel, you know, optimistic about future generations and especially um, knowing what we do here at UNE to help prepare students um, to work most effectively and to engage across sectors. Um, I, I just hope that that's, um, that's the same sort of across the board in higher education. All right, I'll jump in. Um, I, I had said earlier uh, that, that sociologists aren't great at, pr at proposing solutions, um, but I do think sociology does point to the importance of coalitional politics when it comes to, to struggles uh, against any form of power or oppression, um, and that also, and, then, and therefore collaboration is, is fundamentally necessary. Um, I, do, I do find promise in citizen science initiatives, participatory health research um, that, that does reconnect conceive of affected populations as experts or creators of formal knowledge. Um, but I do, but, but at the same time, right, I can't help but caution <laughs> that say uh, that it, all of our talks today have pointed to sort of the structural causes of environmental injustice and environmental ill health. And so I would just hope that those kinds of collaborative initiatives, um, though they might have individualist interventions, um, still don't stop there, right? And, and, and seek to intervene in the structures that create these environmental injustices. Yeah, it's very interesting how these concluding remarks, each of us came to them independently, but how, how much they resonate. We are all hitting on this. Uh, it seems to be the, the trans, transdisciplinary collaboration on research and implementation is important, but even more important is collaboration with the organizations and the communities that are actually experiencing the environmental injustice firsthand. Community-based participatory research, which Bridget mentioned, is, provides a, a tested paradigm for research and implementation of environmental justice concerns. CBPR involves community members and community-based organizations in all aspects of the research project, project from the very beginning, from the formulation of the research question to gathering data, to disseminating results. So there are paradigms out there and I, 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 I would love to see um, more of those being implemented um, right here at UNE and, and also they might already be doing that quite, quite well, but we need to strengthen that. I think privileging the involvement of actors within the environmental justice movement, within the climate justice movement, within the native sovereignty movement, following the lead of those who are directly experiencing environmental injustice is really what can help guide the way, the way toward lasting solutions. Thanks. Thank you to our three amazing panelists for sharing their inspiration and expertise. We're so grateful that you took the time to speak with us here today. If, if you have any more questions or thoughts to share, uh, please contact our panelists directly. They'd love to hear from you. Audience, before you leave today, please fill out our brief attendance survey uh, shown on the screen and posted in the chat. As a reminder to students, today's event 
uh, address interprofes interprofessional competencies of values and ethics and communication and can be applied to UNE students interprofessional honors distinction badge. Many thanks to all of you for joining us here today. And thank you to our wonderful partners, the UNE Planetary Health Council and Center for Excellence in Collaborative Education. Thank you.